Hello, everyone, and welcome to Moms and Murder, a true crime podcast featuring myself, Mandy, my dear friend, Melissa. And today, only today, we have a very, very special guest. Uh, We've been talking about this for at least a week or so. Ad nauseum, really. Yeah, we did mention this on our last episode um, last week. So today we have none other than Josh Mankiewicz. How are you today, Josh? I'm great. Happy to be here. Yes, we're so happy to have you. Um, Thank you so much for coming on. We um, absolutely love Dateline. We love you. We have a ton of listeners who are huge fans of the Manx. Yes. Yeah. So uh, this is a real treat for everyone. And we just can't wait to put the episode out and have our listeners hear from you uh, yourself. So (laughs) do you have a preference on what we call you, Josh, Mankiewicz, Manx, Sir Manx a lot, anything? Uh, uh, (laughs) uh, Any of those are fine. uh, My... uh, when my brother, uh, when my brother had um, had his daughter, um, they named her um, uh, Josie Jolie because, uh, and then they went through this big thing with me about how you know we want people to be able to call her JJ as she gets older because we think that's a good nickname. I'm like, yeah, well, you know, great, except she's going to be called Mank, which is what all other men. Yeah. <laughs> Up to you what you name her. Yeah. If you try and force a nickname early yeah. on, maybe it'll stick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We've, all, we've all been known at one time in our lives or at all times in our lives as Mank. So, yeah. uh, but but, but uh, Mank or Manx, uh, I don't hear Sir, Sir Manx a lot quite as often as I <laughs> I can make it happen for you. Like I will to, make it happen. But, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, whatever you guys want to do is fine. Perfect. So we'll get right into some questions with you if you are good with that. Um, sure. The big question is, of course... How does a story come to you? How do you get um, one of your stories? Do you have the victim's family reaching out to you, or are you and your producers actively looking for these stories combination? I would, I would say that the victim's family reaching out to us is the least likely way in which we get stories, or the least common way. You know, we've been around now for this is our twenty sixth season. Yeah. We know a lot of prosecutors, a lot of homicide detectives, uh, uh, and a lot of defense attorneys. Um, and they reach out to us sometimes with mm-hmm. stories. Um, we also sometimes get them through through local television stations in which someone will say to us, hey, uh, you know, there was a, you know, really weird murder two weeks ago, and they just arrested um, the wife, and it turns out she was in league with the guy's girlfriend, and this sounds like something your guys are going to want, yeah. and you start making calls on it. Because, you know, there's, there are too many murders for us to make calls on every one. You never know whether... The one, I mean, the one that you're gonna, the one that you're making calls on, is gonna actually turn out to sort of have the, the, uh, the, the guts that's necessary for a Dateline story, which we'll get into in a minute. So we get stories over the transom like that from prosecutors, police, defense attorneys, uh, and other people in journalism. And of course, we also know a lot of print reporters over the years because frequently they cover these stories from start to finish. And right. you know, if you watch Dateline, you know, we sometimes interview them to, to sort of get the narrative along. Um, we also read the newspapers all over the country every day. Oh, wow. Uh, there are people in New York who have split up the country into different um, uh, uh, geographical areas. And so somebody reads all the Pennsylvania newspapers every day. And somebody else, somebody reads all the Florida newspapers every day, which is probably a lot of fun. Yeah, best uh, of luck to them. <laughs> um, because uh, parenthetically, without Florida and Texas, we'd almost certainly be <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, yeah, um, but um, uh, uh, so that's another way we do it, and we start making calls. Again, you never know when you hear about a murder whether it's going to be something we're going to want to do because we don't want to do every murder. We don't want to do the most violent murder. Right. A lot of stories, sex crimes, crimes against children, particularly bloody or grisly murders, we don't do because the audience is just going to change the channel. Right. Dateline's not as much about murder as it is about relationships. You know, I mean, the typical Dateline story, which people, you know, sort of talk about jokingly, but also is to some degree true, is, you know, the marriage that seems to be going perfectly, but behind the scenes it's not going perfectly, and then something awful happens, which might relate back or might not to one of the spouses. And then, you know, as David, as uh, Dennis Murphy um uh, notably said, or something that gets quoted all the time, it's never the murder, it's always the marriage. That's what the stories are usually about. They're usually about the relationship and how it went bad, and then the sort of tick-tock of the police procedural as it moves from start to, to finish. Um, we usually do stories that are over for a bunch of reasons. Um, first of all, 
you want an ending. Right. You don't want to hear, uh, you know, um, who killed Anne? Could it be her husband, Bill? We don't know. Good yeah. night. <laughs> no. um, we want, you know, it, it, those stories end with Bill was convicted. He got life. Good night. Right. Um, the audience, we tried to do cold cases for a while. And the audience really didn't like it. The other thing is that frequently prosecutors and uh, uh, detectives won't talk to you until the case is fully adjudicated because they don't want to say anything that later might come up in court. Right. You also want to wait till the end because you want that court file, which then becomes usually public domain at the end of the case, which means you can get the crime scene photos, you can get that 911 tape when the person did or didn't seem appropriately upset, and any interrogation footage, and all the stuff we really kind of need to make make the story go. Uh, so that's generally why we wait until the end, and usually it's a long, long answer, but that's how we get the stories. We either read about them or we hear about them. L least likely, least common, is someone calls us and says you should do our story. But that brings up something else, which is, you know, we don't pay anybody. Mm -hmm. um, everybody who's on Dateline is on only because they want to be. And frequently we hear about a story, which sounds to us like a great story, and one of two things happen. The people either want to be paid, which happens sometimes, in which case we have to say, I'm sorry, we can't do that. And I understand why you might want to be paid because you just lost the breadwinner or you right. have a lot of legal fees. I mean, I get why people might want to be able to, to, to monetize some of that, but we don't pay. And the other thing is, is sometimes people don't want to talk. And if people don't want to talk, you know, 99 times out of 100, you're not going to go forward. I mean, right. you need to be able to talk to, with them. You need somebody from the family. For sure. I'm sure that's a double-edged sword, too, with the family a lot of times. But you guys covered a case recently, I think it was one of yours, where the husband ended up being arrested where the, I wish I remember the name of it, the wife had cancer. She... um gets strangled by it, what ends up being her best friend. He goes to jail for it. And then you guys recently had an update. It must not be one of yours. It, wasn't it was mine. called the poker it case. Yeah, it was, I, think it was, yeah. I think it was one of Keith's. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I remember that from a couple of weeks ago. Where um, it was a conclusion, but not really, because, you know, stuff came to light later on, which was interesting. Right. And if stuff comes to light later on, we, we almost always update these hours. Yeah. And, uh, you know, maybe do a... You know, sometimes we take what used to be every hour is six parts, six acts, um, separated by those all important commercials, which I need you to watch very carefully. <laughs> uh, and uh, do not fast forward because my NBC know, app uh, doesn't let me, so you're good. <laughs> so, so sometimes when we're redoing it, we'll take the material that was in six acts and sort of shave it down a little bit, get it into five, so that we can, you know, bring you the last act of sort of. And now here's what's happened since we last brought you the story, and and do another like 10 or 12 minutes at the end that, that is the latest stuff. Right. I, I've seen you get some flack on Twitter about calling those new episodes when all it is is an yeah. update show. Yeah, yeah. People, You're personally yeah. responsible for that. <laughs> yeah. People, yeah, um, some, uh, yeah. The one thing that – look, I love being on Twitter, as you can probably tell. Yeah. But uh, uh, because it's great because it, it tells you, you know, for many years – we had no way of knowing what it was that the audience thought about what we did. And that was true when I was a political reporter in uh, New York City and in Los Angeles. And that was true when I was a correspondent for ABC News. Um, and it was true when I worked at Dateline, which was the ratings were sort of the only measure you had of what the audience thought. If they watched, then they liked it. If they didn't watch, then they didn't like it. Well, that's that's kind of crude and it's not really true. Mm -hmm. Um Ratings are, in a lot of cases, a function of uh, what's on opposite you or what time it is. Or sometimes, you know, if it's a beautiful day in California, the, the ratings go down because people are going to go out. Um, so uh, the great thing about Twitter yeah. is you actually know what it is that people are thinking. They actually tell you in real time, like, I know this is the guy, or I know this isn't the guy, right. or this episode's old. Um, <laughs> and one of the things that emerges from this sort of, you know, real-time evaluation of the product with the audience is that people think these things are very easy to do, right? And we should have a new one, like, not just every week, but like two, three times a week. Um, and updates are, I already know it. I, I don't want to know. You know, that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's, not, that's, not a real, that's not a real new episode. 
I mean, it takes us almost as much time to do an update as it does do, to do a new episode because mm. I still have to fly to Kentucky and I still have to interview like five people and I still have to like come back and rewrite the whole six part hour into five parts and then I have to write this new part and make it all kind of work together. Right. I mean, it might not be as hard, but it's probably 80% as much work. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but yeah, I know people don't think that updates count. <laughs> they don't want to hear updates. And that, you know, which points up sort of why people watch Dateline, which is that they want to, it's kind of experiential. I mean, they want to, they want to see the crime, hear about the crime, and then sort of figure out along with the police sort of, sort of, you know, what happens and, 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 and who's, who might be responsible and who was under suspicion and who gets cleared. Right. And, you know, once you already know all that, maybe you're not as interested in finding out the latest about somebody's appeal. Yeah. <laughs> right. <Good point. laughs> so that kind of uh, something you said a minute ago kind of brought brought me to uh, another question, which was, of course, how long it takes to produce an episode of Dateline from start to finish. So when you guys decide on a case that you're going to do, what is the process like? How long does it take before that actually goes to air? Well, assuming that the story is completely over, uh, that it's been adjudicated, they had the trial and the, the responsible person, somebody's been convicted and they've been sentenced, and um, um, and everybody's kind of willing to talk at that point, then it's usually about three months. But of course, we are. It can be done in less time than that, and it can last a little longer than that. But two to three months is usually. It's three months about right. Um, so we're at the mercy of trial schedules. So if the you know judge has a heart attack, which you know happened once, if an attorney has a family emergency, and you know then all of, or if there's a mistrial, all of a sudden you're postponing things by mm -hmm. two months, three months, eight months, a year. Um, sometimes defendants in a lot of cases do everything they can to delay the beginning of the trial. So then you're at a point where you've sort of done half the story. Like maybe you've talked to the victim's family and you've been to the crime scene and you've shot some stuff there and you've talked to some people who are going to be witnesses in the trial who have different things to say. But you need the cops and the prosecutor because and they're waiting until it's all over. And sometimes defendants, knowing that when the trial comes, they're likely to be convicted, do everything they can to delay the trial. Right. So... So then all of a sudden we are just waiting and that's why we have to have mo a lot of different irons in the fire at the same time. So I mean, Keith and Dennis and Andrea and I are always working on a bunch of different things at, at, uh, at different times. I mean, at the same time, just not knowing which one of them is going to go and when, I mean, I did a story, um, uh, I guess it was earlier this year. Everything runs together now <laughs> um, about a, um, um, a murder here in Southern California that had happened a number of years earlier. And it was a, uh, you may remember this. It was a, a guy who was an actor um, who ended up being the, uh, the, the guilty party. And he wanted to steal money from a friend of his who I think lived in the, in, in a, the same apartment complex and they kind of knew each other. And right. he kills his friend in his friend's apartment then he disposes of the friend's body, um, cuts it up and hides it in a park. And then he uses the friend's phone to uh, send some text messages to a woman to get her over there. And he kills that woman in the dead guy's apartment. And so that it looks like the, um, uh, the dead guy is actually the murderer and he killed this woman in his apartment and then he fled. Oh. Um, so, so that was a terrible, like a double murder, all to just cover up the theft of some money. And I did the original interviews on that like three years earlier. And the actor who finally got arrested and was doing everything he could to kind of delay the, um, uh, the trial, um, uh, time just sort of ticked by. And it was like, it was about three years before we went ahead and actually finished it where well, there was a trial and he was convicted and then we could talk to everybody else involved. And I couldn't even remember what I, what the interviews were like or who we talked to when the time came to, and I said, I know we interviewed these other people. What do we say? Mm -hmm. and, you know, and the producer was like, no, no, we're fine. We, you know, you asked all the right questions. And then we, we got, I'm like, well, I didn't ask about this. Did I? I don't remember that. They're like, no, you did. Um, so, so 
So, I mean, sometimes it's really long, but that's not usual. Usually it's a period of months, but it can be a period of weeks and it can be a period of days. The question is, how many people do we want to throw at it? Usually every story has a correspondent, a producer assigned just for that story, a senior producer who sort of like edits our copy and makes sure that we're on the right road editorially and also budgetarily, and then one or two associate producers who kind of you know, work in edit rooms, but maybe also go out and with, with crews and take pictures of things, maybe go out and do, you know, interviews um, that don't require my presence, like, you know, something in which um, someone just talks about um, their routine, you know, like they're the guy that found the body. So right. you want them to say, you know, I take a walk at six o'clock every morning and I always walk through the park and all of a sudden I look down, and I found a body. That doesn't necessarily require me asking that question. So sometimes we'll set a producer out to do that. Um, that's usually the team. If we and a videotape editor, sometimes a couple of videotape editors. If we want that to go quicker, we can put more people on it. But that means taking other people away from other things. Right. But the answer is usually a couple of months. Um, do you choose what stories you want to do? Is there just like a you put your hand in a pot and grab one, or what is your? I always say, you know, some of it has to do with just who's available. I and mean, sometimes they call me and they say, "Can you possibly be in?" San Francisco next Tuesday because we had a trial just end and Keith is in Texas and he can't do it. And then I either say, I'd love to, but I'm in Pennsylvania next week. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, or I just go. So, you know, my rule is, you know, you don't have to say yes to everything, but you also can't say no to everything. Mm -hmm. Um, I pitch stuff, um, stuff gets pitched to me. Producers that I've worked with in the past say, you know, I'm going to pitch this story about this case. Are you interested in that? And, it, you know, I, I usually say, yeah, that'll, that sounds great. Let's do, you know, put my name on it. That doesn't mean it'll, it'll, it'll happen, but there's a story meeting every day and, you know, we commission a lot of product. Right. So, so generally it's a sort of a combination of things. They, sometimes they ask you from New York and sometimes you propose it to them and sometimes they say yes. And sometimes they say no also. <laughs> So, of course, you uh, remain impartial to the stories that you do, but has there ever been times where you've gone into a story either thinking that somebody was guilty or not guilty and then changed your mind after you've met them or interviewed them? Um, yeah, there was a story. Um, um, now I can't think of his name. Doug Scott, I think is his name. Um, he was a um, uh, he was a nutritionist in um, – uh, in in Phoenix, I think he was the nutritionist for the Phoenix Suns. I keep thinking I might have his na last name wrong. Uh, they were. Uh, hold on one sec. Now I'm going to look this up. <laughs> no, no problem. Because I don't want to. I don't want real time investigations. Wrong. Yes, this is a dayline investigation <laughs> right now on my iPad. Um, uh, uh, what was it called? Grant Doug Grant, not Doug Scott. Um, um, he was a, a uh, he was a nutritionist um, and uh, you know very famous like vitamin purveyor, and he was accused of having drowned his wife, um, and he was convicted of drowning his wife, um, and then you know as part of his defense and as part of the the, the investigation kind of uh, unfurled, it turned out that his wife has probably tried to kill herself at least one other time, that she probably suffered from some kind of clinical depression. And, and he, um, he, what he really should have done with her was probably get her some psychotherapy, right. but he didn't. He was giving her like, you know, vitamin E or something. I don't know what he was doing. He was giving her some kind of supplement to make her feel better. And what she needed was some kind of like actual, like medical or psychological or psychiatric therapy. And she had, she kept these journals in which uh, she talked about her own demise and about how she thought she was going to die and she wasn't sick or anything. Yeah. And she thought that she was going to die and that he was going to marry this other woman that he knew and they were going to have a baby together. She had these visions of this. Right. And then she did die. She drowned in the tub after taking a bunch of pills and her husband, right after that, and he wasn't the greatest guy because he probably had cheated on her a few times yeah. with this other woman. Uh, he then did marry the other woman, who was a lot younger than he was, and they did have a baby. And then he got arrested, and he was tried for murder, and he was convicted. Now, 
he may not have been the greatest guy, but as I was doing that story, it, it became abundantly clear to me. Oh, and that wrapped up in all of this was the fact that all of them were Mormon. Yeah, which I remember which, this story played a role in the in the story. Um, um, uh, FYI, half my family is Mormon. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, um. And the, the the journals that Faline, Faline right. Grant had kept, um, uh, made it abundantly clear that she was thinking a lot about her own death. Mm -hmm. Not that she was afraid of her husband, but that she was planning a an existence which ended at some time fairly soon, and she wanted her husband to be happy with this other woman. Uh, that being the case, I personally came to the conclusion while we were doing the story, despite the fact that Doug Grant was pretty far from like the nicest guy I'd ever met or the best husband, yeah. uh, that I couldn't possibly have voted to convict that guy. Mm -hmm. um, but a jury did, and he's locked yeah. up. I remember wow. that story, um, hearing the daughter on trial or, you know, in court. She mm -hmm. broke my heart. I remember. Yeah, that was a really... That's right. Yeah, the wife, the new wife brought the baby in. That's yeah, right. yeah. It was... That's right. Yeah, that was a tough no, one. It, hmm. it was uh, it was a terrible story. There have been a couple other stories like that that uh, in which I think to myself, you know, based on what I hear, I, I don't hear a guilty verdict here. Yeah. Do you um into that? Do you think now with this like resurgence or not resurgence, but really just popularity, for lack of a better word, of true crime and that sort of thing? Do you think juries will? be able to look at things more openly like that to be able to say, yeah, this person is kind of a crappy husband, but you know, and is it beyond a reasonable doubt? Are they guilty beyond a reasonable doubt? I, you know, I think one of the, I think it's becoming increasingly hard for juries to set aside the world that they see on television and mm. stick to the facts of the case. Um, you know, prosecutors always talk about something called the CSI effect in which Juries say to them, particularly after the fact, when they're inter being interviewed after the verdict, oh, well, we were upset because you didn't have any DNA. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, this isn't NCIS. There isn't always DNA. Particularly in smaller jurisdictions, testing a lot of things for DNA is prohibitively expensive. So you have to kind of like do your best. Sometimes killers don't leave DNA behind. Sometimes there isn't a uh, surveillance video that can be enhanced to show somebody's license plate. That doesn't yeah. exist you know, the facial recognition software to, <laughs> to pick somebody out of a crowd and match them up with their criminal record. That's Hollywood fantasy. But, you know, people have been indoctrinated in the world of forensics to a probably dangerous extent in, the, in that most people think they know more than they really know. You know, I had some guy at a party come up to me and start talking about high velocity spatter. <laughs> and I was like, What's I said to him, are you a CSI? He goes, oh, no, no, I'm a real estate agent. <laughs> I watched Dexter. <laughs> so, I mean, that's the way, that's gonna, that guy's going to get on a jury. And yeah. his expertise is going to be, you know, involved in some murder case. I yeah. hope not mine, yeah. you know? <laughs> so, Me I mean, too. I think it's harder and harder for people to put aside the stuff they know or the stuff they think they know and just concentrate on what's on what's in front of them. Everybody now thinks they're an expert. Yeah. I would agree. <laughs> so on that note, why do you think uh, that there's such a big fascination now with true crime? I mean, obviously we are. We do an entire podcast about it, and we're far from the only ones doing uh, a podcast no, on true crime. No, so, there's a lot of them out there. Um, but we're the know, best. Yeah. <laughs> although, although, although this clearly is the one that most people should be watching. Thank you. Right? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Seal of approval. I don't actually know why. I don't actually know why any of those other ones exist. <laughs> um, That's going to be our soundbite forever. Right. Um, <laughs> So here's what I think, because I say I get asked this, uh, you know, a bunch of times. You know, we live in a world in which nothing seems to work the way it's supposed to. You know, there's too many cars ahead of you. There's too many people in line ahead of you at the, at the drugstore. Uh, you know, Washington obviously hasn't worked the way it's supposed to for quite a long time. Okay. You know, you go to the airport, like, it's a disaster, right? You know, um, you know, there's too many kids in your uh, in, in your son or daughter's class for the teacher to pay proper attention. There's just so many things. You know, and they're cutting funding while that's happening. Right. But for one hour or two hours, once a week, Friday nights, the world works the way it's supposed to. That cheating, lying, conniving spouse, right? Right. Whether it's, you know, whether it's, you know, Jody Arias or Dalia DiPolito, 
right? Mm -hmm. They're going to get what's coming to them. And I think there is a, I think that is partly what stokes this interest in it is there is this feeling that this is the way things are supposed to work because, you know, I mean, Dayline's often really sort of about the best in police work. Right. You know, I mean, we're, we're the, the, we talk about, I mean, Joseph Wamba, uh, who was a LAPD sergeant who wrote a bunch of, uh, of, of crime novels. He used to say that the stories he wanted to tell were the ones that were not about how the cops work on the cases, but how the cases work on the cops. That's also the kind of story that we want to tell. And, the guys like that, the guys who keep the file with them for years, you know, right. uh, uh, the men and women who like, you know, don't want to give up on the case, even though they don't have an answer. Like those are sort of inspirational characters. And they are in that sense, very much like people you see on television. Um, and sure. except it's true. So I think it's sort of a combination of, of, of all of that, the, the sort of heroic nature of some prosecutors and investigators who really like won't take no for an answer and the audience's desire to see some damn thing work the way it's supposed to. Absolutely. It's been a while since I've had a baby of my own, and some days I miss it so much. The baby cuddles and baby smiles, but when it comes to diaper rashes, not so much. I remember the first time my oldest had a diaper rash, I was really devastated. Here's this tiny thing totally dependent on me, and now she's fussy and obviously uncomfortable, and I'm supposed to have the answers. Well, with time and treatment, it went away, but what I really wanted was to avoid it altogether. And now, baby butts rejoice. New Huggies Skin Essentials are here. A brand new dermatologist-approved line of diapers, wipes, and pull-ups training pants, all designed with baby's sensitive skin in mind. The wipes are thick and have zero harsh ingredients for a great gentle clean. Pull-Up Skin Essentials has got your big kid covered, too, with a training pant that's ultra-soft and breathable to help protect sensitive skin throughout potty training. Whether you're a first-time parent or a seasoned pro, make it easy on yourself and your baby with Huggies. Learn more at Huggies.com. Once again, head to Huggies.com to learn more. Hey guys, as you know, I'm someone who loves knowing a little about everything. I love the news, I love entertainment, I love it all, but sometimes I don't have enough time to get all the information, all the little details, and the minutia of everyday news because, my goodness, it's constantly going. But thanks to the Newsworthy podcast, I can get all I need in little bite-sized pieces. So if the stress of the news is getting you down, but you still want to know what's going on in things like the election, check out the Newsworthy. And in these 10-minute episodes, they're just on-the-go listening. I can listen to it quickly on a walk, on my way bringing my kids to or from school or one of their activities. When I'm in line at the grocery store, there's never a wrong time to listen to the newsworthy. But if you feel bogged down by the news and kind of the negativity of it, but you still want to be informed on what's going on, the newsworthy is the place to do it. Erica at the newsworthy is an independent journalist and her team does really all the hard work and research for you. I love that the episodes are so well rounded and there will be fun stuff like tech or big stories. But the way Erica gives this, you know, efficient and neutral overview of the news and in just 10 minutes each weekday, it's it's, it's perfect. Just search The Newsworthy in your podcast app or go to thenewsworthy.com to start listening. Again, search for the podcast The Newsworthy, two words, The Newsworthy, to make staying informed easier and more enjoyable every weekday. You're right. Um, this is a very important question. Um, how, like, I, I've heard it said that your hips do not lie. <laughs> They do not. <laughs> they do not lie. Do not. Uh, oh, and your your finger wagging. That's my. That's your only. Who would have thought? Okay. okay. How is that your now, only? Let gift? me just say that. Let me just say that. When I did that on television, <laughs> right? Yeah. I knew that was going to get on the air. Yeah. Okay? I mean, when I was doing an interview with a woman uh, on a uh, case in Texas, and it only worked because she wasn't like the victim's family right. or law enforcement or something. She was a friend of the victim who was talking about a third party who later ended up being the guilty party. But at the time we were telling that part of the story, it wasn't clear who he was. And she was talking about how he did not respect the fact that she was as worldly as she was. Mm -hmm. And so, although she'd lived a large portion of her life in Paris, this guy didn't know it. And so he said to her, well, if you'd ever been to Paris, you'd know that. And she was like horrified that somebody would not recognize how worldly and sophisticated she was. Right. So I was, I, so I did that. <laughs> right? And I remember thinking to myself, that's probably going to get on Dateline. Yeah. What I did not think <laughs> was that that is now going to be part of the, 
of the image search bank. If you put in Dateline onto your into your uh, into your phone, oh yeah, uh, when you're looking for a GIF or GIF or however we're pronouncing it this week, mm-hmm. you see this thing. I love that. Absolutely, uh, I couldn't be prouder. We've like probably used it three times this week. Yeah, in, in <laughs> preparation for this, we're actually disappointed that that's the only Manx GIF available right now. So whoever know, we need to talk to to get more, we need to do that. Yeah, we we need to get about, that done. <laughs> Talk about the system not working correctly. Yeah, um, yeah. this is in the real yeah. injustice. Yeah, I, you know, I wanted to use that. I wanted to make that my Twitter um, image. And you can do it, but you can't get it to animate. For some reason, uh, Twitter, at least when I did it, they wouldn't let you do it. So I'll start. But it is there, and you can it is there, and you can use it whenever you want. <laughs> I'm very happy to see that. Yeah. I, so when I saw when I saw that the first time, somebody sent it to me. Man, I sent that to New York immediately. I looked, I'm like, look at this. <laughs> it's the best ever. In in that, um, our friend, one of our listeners, Kim, she just won the new Manknet and Dateline oh, yeah. stuff from Thanksgiving because you were so cool to. Say happy Thanksgiving with a drumstick. Right, so wh- right. what is a mink net? Because people yeah. in our group were freaking out. <laughs> okay. I'm freaking out. Okay. I need to know. <laughs> okay. First of all, we're idiots because <laughs> we the happy Thanksgiving thing only occurred to somebody a couple of days before Thanksgiving. Of course, the way to do this would have been to line up a bunch of my episodes on ID just yep. for that day, right? Which if we'd had a few months to sort of plan it, we probably could have persuaded them to do it. When we don't run ID, but they might have gone right. with that. But we didn't even think about it in time. Um, uh, you need so to hire books. Kim. She she had it. Exactly <laughs> what we need to do. So, uh, so um, uh, one of the other problems uh, is that the the NBC store, which is located in uh, Thirty Rock, or as I refer to it, the biased and failing NBC store, <laughs> um, uh, uh, does not and has not historically carried any Dateline merchandise. There was a time when they carried a mug that said, don't watch alone. Uh, and there was a time when they had this number of years back when they had like a, eh, there was a notebook you could get, I think you could get a hat. And then for a long period of time, there was nothing. Now hmm. we are the longest running primetime show on NBC by a lot of years. Right. And there is nothing of us in the NBC store until very recently when they put some new stuff in, probably because we were complaining so much. And one of the things that we made, but that is not in the NBC store, are these little tiny magnets, which I don't have because I give them all away. But they're about three or four inches high, and they're like these full-body magnets of us, of all the correspondents. Oh, nice. Oh, man, I missed out on that. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 they're, and you can clip them to your refrigerator. And, you know... Just like me, the magnet tries to get as close to the food as possible. So, <laughs> Does Keith lean on things? Because that's you can an important have Keith's question. Lean. You can do whatever yeah. you want. Yeah, yeah. if you could yeah. smirk and he could lean, that would be it's it. Perfect. Something yeah, animated. Agree. Yeah. Um, um, but um, give the people what yeah, they want. But I mean, I, like if, I, I'm telling you, if they sold those magnets in the biased and failing NBC store, <laughs> they would sell them out. And yeah. They don't have them. I don't know why they don't have them. You have to ask somebody else. Yeah. <laughs> so we've we've had a few, but like every time, you know, we don't have a big budget for promotional stuff. And every time we make them, you know, we'll make, you know, I don't know, 25 or 30 of them. And then they're gone. Mm-hmm. You know, of course, they're not all of me. They're of everybody else, too. There's a Lester and, and all the correspondents. And so they all like vanish immediately. So if you sold those, I'm pretty sure people would buy them. I'm sure we know a lot of people, including us, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> I, I will, I will, I will, I don't have any, but I will ask New York if there's a mank net. I will, I will, I will try. And that's to, a, a snuggie, right? Is that basically just a giant? Okay. okay. First of all, first of all, we got into this huge, like, uh, trademark thing because snuggie right. is, uh, <laughs> snuggie is like, you know, milk of magnesia, Kleenex, and windbreaker. Yeah. It belongs to people. <laughs> yeah. Um, so. <laughs> So we do not have a Dateline snuggie. No, no, we had never. We a thing a few years ago called the Dateline cover-up, but we don't have that anymore <laughs> either. It was very snuggy like but that's gone. That was that was a few years ago. Yeah. Um, some people still have them because I think they're made of some, like, essentially indestructible material. <laughs> Perfect. So the magnet is the magnet, not the blanket. It's, it's, the, it's the magnet, yes. Okay. okay. <laughs> Thank you for yeah. clearing that up yes. for us. Yes. It's small, too. I mean, it's like it's like, like – Four or five inches long. It's it's. Uh, that's perfect. Hey, it's big. Yeah. That's bigger than the magnets we send out to people. So. But it's perfect for the. It's perfect for one's refrigerator. It's yeah. great. Love it. 
So since we're being kind of silly right now, we have been dying to ask you how many pocket squares you own. Yeah, I saw that. Um, uh, I had a feeling you were going to ask about that. Um, <laughs> it's important. I don't know because I, um, um, I buy a lot of them. Um, and uh, I don't know, probably a couple of hundred. Oh, anyway. my goodness. Wow. Well. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, the other thing is like people start, you know, once you start being famous for wearing them, um, and I was like wearing them. I've been wearing them for like 30 years. So, so yeah, I started sort of right in the early eighties and, uh, uh, and it's, um, people start giving them to you as presents because right. they're like an easy Christmas or birthday present. So I have a lot. I really have a lot. I probably do have a couple hundred. Although lately I've just been wearing like, you know, little solid colored ones, but I'm, I'm sure I'll be back to all, reusing all of them eventually. I never get rid of them. There you go. Um, when you want to relax on a Friday night, we our relaxation is putting our kids to sleep, having a glass of wine, watching Dateline. What is a Josh Mankiewicz relaxation? Okay, Friday night? I am when I am. Uh, you talking about when I'm on or when I'm not on? How about both? Okay, well, when I'm not on, I might, uh, you know, my wife and I might go out. Um, well, I might not be there watching Dateline Live, but I always DVR and I watch it either later that night or the next day. That's if it's not my episode. But if it's my episode, uh, Friday night is not relaxing at all. Um, mm. uh, because uh, we all um, are, um, we're all very committed to sort of being there on social media, on, on Facebook and also on Twitter, right. sort of as the episode's unfolding so that people can ask us questions about it. And I mean, it was it was all consuming when we started doing this a few years ago, and now it's ramped up to even more and more and more. I mean, there are so many messages on Twitter. I, I can't even get to all of them. And I feel like I should because, like, if you're going to take the time to write to me, even if all you're saying, oh, this is so great, or I'm on the edge of my seat, I'm not going to – I don't have time to write back to you, but I might give you a little, give you a little star or a yeah. heart, <laughs> you know? Um, so – I mean, yeah, you try to acknowledge at least everybody that's, uh, that's 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 writing in, and sometimes they have pretty good questions. And also, we want to keep the discussion going, so right. I'll say things like, you know, you know, do you believe Bill's confession, or you know, what do you, you know, is, what do you think he's hiding, or yeah. you know, have you ever, you know, have you ever bought a burner phone? Before? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, so I mean, yeah, we have to sort of keep this thing going. And people, you know, I also keep track of who guesses correctly. Uh, nice. who the murderer is um, and there's a few people that are uh, that are pretty committed to doing that and some of them are pretty good at it that's concerning <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or they have a, a job in law enforcement one of the yeah no, some, <laughs> some people are there and, and people ask you know this is part of what I was telling you about that back and forth with the audience which is like so great I mean we really find out sort of what they're thinking you know somebody said to us or said to me uh, recently on one of the stories they're like, oh, well, this guy looks suspicious, but I know he's not the guy because the first guy you show us is never the guy. Hmm. And I thought, okay, the next time I write one of these, the first <laughs> guy is going to be the guy. <laughs> um, um, but, uh, I mean, the people pay a lot of attention to, to the way we do it. Yeah. And that's, you know, there, there's two sides to what we do. There's the story. Uh which is deadly serious and which is like in almost all cases, the most awful thing that has happened to some of the people that you're interviewing. Right. And there's nothing funny or amusing or lighthearted about it. It is awful and it's going to wreck them for the rest of their lives. And there's no getting over it. And the idea that somehow you can convict somebody and send them to death row, that somehow then the scales are even or there's, or there's, or there's something called closure. Yeah, uh, no. That's bullshit. There isn't anything like right. that. Um, and anybody who's had any sort of close brush with the criminal justice system knows that that's true. So, I mean, I hope nobody who's listening has been, you know, touched by violent crime, but if they have, then you know how terrible that is. Right. But the other side of it, of course, is the storytelling. I mean, we don't begin Dateline by saying, uh, this is a story about a guy who was accused of killing his wife, but it turned out it was the next door neighbor who she was having an affair with. Now stay tuned for the next 58 minutes. <laughs> we don't do that. Um, you know, we're going to lead you around some corners. We're going to talk about the marriage and how everything was good. And then all of a sudden everything wasn't good. And some people thought, you know, there'd been some violence and, you know, whatever. Right. But however it goes. And that part of it, of course, is kind of fun as you sort of lead the audience along. But ultimately, you know, we have to stay 
we're slaves to the truth. We have to stay true to what did happen. We're not going to say, you know, you know, uh, uh, you know, in the investigation of whether Bill killed Mary, you know, Dave was a suspect. If Dave was not a suspect, right? We, you know, um, uh, now sometimes, um, uh, uh, you know, we'll we'll fully explore the issue of whether Dave was a suspect when, in fact, cops may have discarded Dave after like three days. They've determined he probably couldn't have done it, and we'll we'll you know not we we will at the end of the episode we'll say. And by the way, Dave, who was briefly under suspicion, you know, right. was fully cleared. Yeah. So I mean, we ultimately have to stick with the truth. But how we get from from the beginning of the story to the end of the story is sometimes kind of fun. Yeah. Uh, and 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 that's we sort of see. I sort of see that on social media all the time. Is where people are. Or just say, like, I'm completely stumped. I have no idea who it is. Yeah. And then I think like, oh, we did a good job. Or sometimes if, if there's a, a great red herring, I mean, if there's, you know, there's somebody who, you know, made threats against the victim and didn't have an alibi and is acting peculiarly. And, you know, then it turns out it's not that person. You know, we're going to live in that a little bit. Right. And when we tell the story, and that's always a lot of fun. Yeah, I read um, or I might have heard you on something talking about when you would go interview somebody in in jail and you wanted it to look like it wasn't in in prison, I guess. And sometimes I love that. it depends on the correctional institution. Right. Some of them, you know, some of them will not even let you in the room with the guy. You're on the other side of glass, and so obviously there's no question that the person you're interviewing is incarcerated. Some of them will not let you interview him when he's wearing anything other than that jumpsuit that they're wearing, which in some cases is orange, in some cases is dark green, in some cases is white, but it looks like prison garb. Right. But some institutions, and some of them are private and some of them are, are state run, some of them are like, yeah, if you want to, you know, you know, as long as we can be there in the room when it's happening, you can, you can get by another, buy shirts for him or buy something else. So, I mean, we did an interview, I don't know, a couple of years ago. Uh, in some place in, um, I think in Kentucky, and uh, and the guy was wearing an orange jumpsuit, but he was wearing a white T-shirt under it. Right. So he was able to take the jumpsuit. You know, he's only being photographed like I am now. So he was able to take the top of it off and just pull it down to his waist. So now he's just wearing a white T-shirt. And then we'd gone to Banana Republic and we bought a, a dress shirt for him, which he put on over his T-shirt, and then behind him. We put on, we put some candles. Right. So it looked I like he it. was, you know, it looked like he was in his living room. <laughs> uh, you know, so, th- and that really helps because you see that in the, and then we interview them normally. And, right. uh, you know, but you see the audience saying, well, that guy's obviously not arrested, so it must not be him. Right. That lets you get that person and their story into the story. Um, a lot sooner than you otherwise would have, because the minute you interview somebody in there in orange, like everybody pretty much knows what's going on. Yeah. The other, I mean, I we did an interview once in Arizona in which on the way to the prison, we took the oil painting off the wall of my hotel room and put it in with the gear. And then we get to the prison and the guards are searching through our gear to make sure we're not bringing in anything. And you see them stop at the, I was watching them and they stop at this. <laughs> this and then you can see them thinking like, well, it's not a weapon. Yeah. <laughs> it's a piece of art. I don't know why they need it, but not going to hurt anybody and so (laughs) we hang that behind the guy and then he was wearing fortunately in this particular prison everybody wore a white the inmates all wore a white polo shirt Mm -hmm. which you know which had the name of the institution here so i took off my jacket and we put it on him so that obscured the name of the institution. So now he's wearing a white polo shirt and a jacket. And he's got painting on the wall behind him. And then he also looked like he was home in front of the, you know, painting of his grandfather or something. I and that it. was great. And then at the end, you know, after the story's been told, then you pull back and you see he's he's shackled. Yeah. But stuff like that is definitely a lot of fun because it allows us to sort of draw out the suspense as to who who ended up getting convicted. Yeah. As a viewer, I'm always looking for clues in there or like the the women's makeup if it looks like it's been right. on with a sharpie. I've you know, I, I'm I'm in on it, but you've you've gotten right. me a few times, so I love it. Yeah, well, we we try, we do try. <laughs> we do think about that. I mean, the other way to do it is you know to not interview the person until the end. Yeah. You know, I mean, sometimes we don't. I mean, the other way to do it is if you can't disguise the location or dress of the guilty party, then you don't show him or her, and you also don't show the other possible suspect. 
Right. You know, so you, you don't show the wife and you also don't show the next door neighbor. Yeah. So it's clearly one of them, but you're not interviewing either one. So the audience doesn't really know, okay, one of these people is locked up and the other one isn't talking or at least hasn't been seen yet. Right. And that's one way of doing it if you can't change the way they're dressed. Perfect. The other thing you can do, of course, and we've done this, uh, is show innocent people in a way that makes it look like they're incarcerated. Yeah. Um, that always I mean, throws it, me off. Yeah. You're you know, I did an interview. I, well, I didn't tell this guy to do it, but this was a guy I did an interview earlier this year with a guy who'd been convicted, gotten a new trial, and then acquitted at the second trial and now was free. And so he was going to tell the whole story all the way through what it was like to be charged and convicted and then serve some time. He did a couple of years and then get a new trial. Um, and it turned out it was because police had measured the crime scene incorrectly. Meaning mm. that he was essentially meaning that the story he had told to police and at the first trial was actually Accurate. feasible. Mm. Yeah, it was actually it could have happened. And the medical examiner said, "Well, okay, if that's true, then I'm changing my finding back from homicide to undetermined," and that was the end of it. Then he was he was found uh, uh, not guilty at the next trial. So he came in for the interview um, to tell his sort of story of incarceration and then later freedom. And we had rented a warehouse, which just had a kind of a cinder block wall. And he comes in and he's wearing a white thermal long sleeved t-shirt. Oh, nice. And, and he said, I brought this because we used to wear these in, in, in prison because they're very cold in there. So everybody wanted to, their families would get them one of these. And so he said, I could just wear, I'm just going to do the interview wearing this. And I said, nice. really? And he said to me, hey, I watch your show. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. So that was great because he really did. I mean, throughout the whole interview, he looked like he was locked up. Yeah. That's yeah. perfect. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we do have a couple more questions. Are you okay on time or are you in a? I'm good. I'm oh, good. Perfect. All right. Uh, so what would be a case that you would say has impacted you personally the most? Well, I mean. It's impossible to say that, you know, I mean, these murders, I mean, they're all awful and they all, they, they, they break some of these people. At the same time, you also see these stories of just like, you know, just tremendous strength and perseverance and faith and people who are able to overcome just like some of the worst things ever happening to them. Right. And so that's always kind of inspirational. And as I said before, you also do kind of see the best of law enforcement and the legal profession. I mean, you see some really dedicated people. Um, so I mean, they're all the ones that are one of the toughest things about this job is to sort of figure out what the emotional distance is going to be that you're going to have to the people you're interviewing. It's pretty easy when you're talking to the police prosecutors and defense attorneys. Right. It's somewhat tougher when you're talking to people who have suffered some unbelievable loss. I mean, when they start crying, like you can't really stop. You can't really start crying along with them. Yeah. You know, you're supposed to have some sort of objectivity. You also can't be like, Hey, come on, snap out of it. We mm -hmm. got an interview to do. Yeah. yeah there's right. Some, there's some, you know, there's some middle ground, ground that you have to take. But, you know, those people stay with you. I mean, I'm still in touch with lots of people who I've interviewed over the years who, you know, suffered some horrific loss. And, you know, you share that story with them. That's a that's a that's a bond sometimes. I mean, there's yeah. a woman in the, there's a woman in San Diego um, named uh, Dana Eras, who um, whose daughter and grandson were both killed by the same guy who was the father of the baby and the and the boyfriend of the daughter. And he didn't want to pay child support, so he killed both of them. And then he also tried to frame somebody else for the murder. And she was shattered by that. Yeah. And then she went on to become this, like, fearless victim's advocate and help write this, this handbook for survivors of violent crime or for families who lost someone to violent crime. Right. And so she was like, Dana was named, like, victim's advocate of the year a couple of years ago here in California. I mean, she's like become, you know, she went from being this like, like grandmother whose like whole life was like sort of stolen from her in, a, in, in an instant to being like this, you know, fearless person. Yeah. So that's like super inspirational for me. Um, uh, you know, I'll never forget the story of Skylar DeLeon, which is really the story of Tom and Jackie Hawks, mm -hmm. who uh, were killed when Mr. DeLeon, who perhaps says he was one of the mighty morphin power rangers and yeah. a child actor not something we could really prove uh mr de leon wanted to steal this yacht that was the, the tom and jackie hawks were selling and so they 
but they, he took them out for a test drive and overpowered them and made them sign over title of uh, the title of the yacht. Right. And, um, and then he drowned them. And, um, uh, that was one of the most horrible stories I've ever had to report. And, yeah. uh, uh, and Mr. DeLeon's attorney made him available to reporters, I think, to try to keep him off death row. So it was a unique opportunity to both tell what was a really, like, mind-bendingly horrible story and also confront the person who had, had been convicted of it. Yeah. And that doesn't always happen. Right. Um, so you don't always get both of those things at the same time because a lot of these people post-conviction, they're not going to talk to you. So – that was a particularly memorable story. And the other story I did that I, I will say definitely affected me was one I did back in 2005, mm -hmm. which was not strictly a murder story, but it was about how, uh, if you watch television in the United States, you'd believe that the only people who are missing are white, blonde, and attractive. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and this was when Natalie Holloway and Lacey Peterson and a bunch of other people were dominating the headlines. And, and that's all that was getting covered. In fact, most of the missing people in the United States are men, mm -hmm. and a much larger section um, are minority mm -hmm. than the than the, uh, the the population as a whole. Mm -hmm. And those people don't get covered at all when they're right. missing. Uh, and so I did a story about that, about how crazy it was, and about the 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 section of the criminal justice system that we were showing on TV versus sort of what was out there at large, and. You know, I, went, I ended up confronting the guy who was at the time my boss because it was his decision at NBC News as to sort of what to show, which was a very weird, difficult interview to do. Yeah. And but for a while, like I sort of felt the ship of state change a little bit. And we stopped doing a lot of that stuff. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, that was good. I, mean, I was glad we did that. That was that was a good story. That's great. Do you have maybe one more question? And we have a quick game to play with you. If you're on board, well, I'm whatever, you, whatever you want to ask. Okay. <laughs> um, I here. guess the last one would be just what advice would you have for new true crime journalists that are kind of We're starting not out? And, no, that's not us. Not us at all. <laughs> no, but for, but for, for others who might be starting out in the same vein that what you have done now for over 20 years, what advice would you have for people like that? Well, I mean, look. Um, first of all, I would tell anybody interested in true crime that one, they have to watch Dateline and two, they have to listen very carefully to moms and murder. Yes. Uh, right? <laughs> Done. Done. And, and then you'll be sort of set. Um, <laughs> you know, I didn't get into reporting 42 years ago because I wanted to be a crime reporter. Right. I actually wanted to be a political reporter. And when I started, I was working in Washington and I covered Capitol Hill. And then I went on to be a political reporter in Washington, D.C. for a local TV station uh, and, uh, and then in New York and then in Los Angeles. And then I came to Dateline and for the first 10 years, it was a Dateline. We did all kinds of things. Right. And then in about 2005, 2006, something around there, we started, uh, doing more of the true crime and, you know, reporting is reporting. I mean, I don't approach stories about murders any differently than I approached stories about, the deficit when I was covering Capitol Hill, right. except the difference is there's some sensitivity that you need to exhibit to the people involved. But my point is, you know, the facts are the facts. The truth is the truth. You have to, you have to challenge everybody, even your sympathetic characters. Um, so, I mean, what advice would I give to somebody wanting to get in? There's no difference between this and other kinds of journalism in terms of what's important. You got to be. You got to get your facts right. You got to stay objective. Right. You can't have an agenda. Uh, um, you don't have to keep your personality out of it. But if you're going to give your opinion, you got to make it clear that you're giving your opinion. A lot of people on TV seem to have almost no personality sometimes, um, uh, which I think is probably a mistake. Um, yeah. You know, and you need to ask the right questions of the right people at the right time. And you need to do the research so that when somebody says A or B, you will know whether A or B is true. And that's true whether you're going to be covering true crime or whether you're going to be covering City Hall where you live. Perfect. Well, thank you for answering all of our millions of questions. That's it. You've got nothing we have, Well, we have more, but I want to be respectful of your time. But I have a game. And, come on, games. Okay. It's important. <laughs> this is important. So we're going to play um, – Basically, Hardy Boy Mystery – do not look at my paper, Mandy. Okay. Hardy Boy Mystery or Dateline episode. 
Um, okay. Josh, you are going to be playing for one of our dear listeners, Addie M. And Mandy, you're going to be playing for uh, Lisa P. So the winner of this, this is like a fight to the death situation. You guys need to win because there is a coffee <laughs> cup involved. And that's I, important. I, I, I want to warn you, I read all the Hardy Boys books uh, when I was a kid up to about 1968. Well, so you have an unfair advantage to this. Plus then. he works at Dateline. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but um, so if you if you guess it's a Dateline one, if you tell me the uh, host you think it was, because I've heard that you don't write your titles. So that's the only part. You. The only you, part. You write everything I, else. The only part of Dateline, well, I mean, the producer and I sometimes write them together, and sometimes right. I write them by myself. But but the only part of it that I have no role in writing at all is the title. Those are chosen by people in New York, and that is perfect for this game. So if you can choose, if you choose that it's a Dateline episode, let me know who you think the host is. If you get it right, I'll give you two points. Otherwise, and people you just are, get one. People are frequently coming up to me in ex- in airports, and they're like. What happened in the mystery in Crystal Cove? Yeah. <laughs> Which one was that? Yeah. I know. I, listen, yeah. I'm, I'm trying to trick you here. Okay, first one up. The House in the Woods. Manx. The House in the Woods is a Dateline episode. Mandy. It does sound like Dateline. Do you guys know who was the the reporter on that? I'm going to say I'm gonna it was... Say Keith. I'm going to say Keith. You're going to say Keith? What Me gonna too. Say? That's what I was going to say. Okay, it is Dateline. <laughs> it was Andrea Canning. How rude, guys. How yeah. rude. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Andrea. The next one is The Secret of the Caves. Secret of the Caves, the Hardy Boys mystery. Mandy? I don't think there's any caves in Dateline, so yeah, Hardy oh, Boys. <laughs> you guys got it. I'm going to give it to you. It's going to get harder. I'm just giving you softballs. All right, you ready? Mystery on sun- Sunrise Drive. That's Dateline. Mandy? I'm going to say Dateline. I don't want to have all the same okay. answers, but these are easy. And then who was... <laughs> Was the, I'll let her go uh, first. Reporter. All right, let's let her go first. Who was the reporter on this, Josh? On uh, If it's a Dateline, uh, Mystery on Sunrise Drive? Yep. I'm going to say Keith again. Mandy? I'm going to say Dennis Murphy. Okay, it was you. So um, <laughs> that was unfortunate. What? Yeah, was you it? did that. It was you. Oh, <laughs> really? Which uh, which one was that? A Tucson, Arizona that. native, Gary Triano, was a successful oh, yeah, real yeah, estate yeah, yeah, developer. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. So yeah, that yeah, was... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was you. I knew I could get you. All right. What happened at midnight? Hardy Boys, Dateline Mandy. Hardy Boys. Josh? What, what's the title? Sorry. What happened at midnight? I'm going to say Hardy Boys. Okay, but the Hardy Boys should not be up at that time of night. But yes, you're both <laughs> correct. All right. While the clock ticked, Mandy. Dateline. Josh? Hardy Boys. Man, he is smoking <laughs> you now. Okay. Secrets in the box. Wait a minute, wait a minute. That's, wait, while the clock ticked? Is while the clock like, ticked, is it? Uh, no, it's a Hardy Boys. You got that one. It's a Hardy Boys, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah she okay. was wrong. Yeah. No, you're smoking her. All right, while the while clock ticked. Okay. <laughs> while the clock ticked, Hardy Boys or Dateline? Dateline. While the clock ticked while is clock ticked. is, is, is uh, Hardy Boys. Did you write the Hardy Boys? <laughs> I'm really upset with myself now. This no, Franklin W. Dixon wrote the Hardy no. Boys. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> And he did an amazing job. <laughs> All right. Footprints in the dust. Hardy Boys, Dateline. Hardy Boys. Josh? Footprints under the window is a Hardy Boys. Footprints in the dust is a Dateline. Perfect. <laughs> and Josh, who was, the, who was the reporter on that one? Eventually, it's going to be Keith, right? My you guess is it. always. You got it. It's, it was Keith. Yeah. I got that one. Secret oh of Pirate's goodness. Hill. Pirate. What is it? Secret. What Secrets is it called? Of Pirate Hill. Pirate's Hill. That has to be Hardy Boys. I think that's Hardy Boys. All right, that's you a got newer. It. That's it's a newer in, Hardy Boys that I didn't read. I thought I would get you with that one. Danger on Diamond Mountain. Danger on what mountain? Diamond Mountain. I'm, I'm going to say Dateline. Josh? I'm going to say Dateline. My goodness, we can't get you. Yes, and then who was the host or who was the reporter on that one? I'm going to say. Andrea. Both wrong. It was <laughs> Keith Morrison. Um, secret, the secret of the Snake River. Hardy Boys. Manx. Dateline. My gosh. He, okay, you know what? Yeah, you're doing well with this. Um, and who was the reporter on that one, sir? That's not my, it's not me, I don't think. Um, uh, or was it? Or was it? Um <laughs> Let's see. Maybe um, I'll go with Dennis again. You got it. 
Oh my gosh, I am losing You're so terrible. bad. <laughs> okay, the house on the cliff. Dateline. Hardy boys. <laughs> Congratulations, Addy. You are kicking butt here. Okay. Addy, <laughs> Addy, you and I. Addy, yeah. Josh has you. Poor, poor, poor Teresa. Um, Lisa. Lisa. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, yeah, even worse now. The girl with the red shoes. Dateline. Josh? Dateline. <laughs> yeah. And who was the one on that? I don't I don't know. Um, Mandy? Dennis Murphy. Uh, Andrea. That would be you, Josh. And that was one of my favorite <laughs> stories. Which one was that? That is um, Annie Cap- Capser. I don't know how to say her last name. Had a second chance at a happy life being adopted by her caseworker. She met that boy, got pregnant, um, or told him that she was pregnant, and then he killed her. She wasn't actually pregnant. She what vanished. Annie, I'm going to spell it for you, K-A-S-P-R-Z-A-K. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. That was yeah. uh, that story broke yeah. my heart. Yep. Okay. Um, yep. Let's see. The Shore Road Mystery. The, what is it? The Shore Road Mystery. Okay. That's Hardy Boys. That's Hardy Boys. My gosh, this is not even fair. Um, <laughs> the Mystery in Rock Hill. That's Dateline. Yeah, Maybe. Dateline. All right. Who's, who's the reporter on that one? Keith. Josh? Andrea. Mandy, you got one right. Woo! <laughs> nice. All right. Last one. Secrets in Silver Lake. That's Dateline and that's me. It is. It's you from last <laughs> month. I love that one. That was – That was good. That was a that good was one. Good. That, that one, I, I was just watching it the other day and I have so many questions about those friends. The the wolf pack situation. Right. Yeah. I – I want to know everything that happened. and I mean, I don't want to know everything, but I want to know a lot of what is happened. Is this like an accomplice situation? No, this it, is – well, you, you tell us. Well, this was, uh, you know, this was about uh, wife swapping and infidelity. Mm-hmm. And like some infidelity was approved and some infidelity wasn't approved. And it was quite a story. And yeah. There was, and, you know, there was the, the, the whole um, – you know, the, the biblical story of David and Bathsheba used to sort of explain away a murder. Yeah. Uh, it hmm. was uh, and it was out in the middle of the California desert where it turns out there's a lot more going on than I thought. There was a oh, lot wow. going on in that. Wow. And who knew Costco samplers were so popular? That's what, what? I thought. <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, Josh, you um, won, uh, which is like an insult to the word winning because you did amazing. So, Addy, you have won a lovely – Coffee cup and Lisa, sorry, I'm so Lisa. sorry you got stuck with Mandy. That's just unfortunate. I say the same thing about myself every day. I got stuck with her. So, um, <laughs> so the last thing we had, it, um, we wanted to ask you, of course, about the upcoming episode um, this next week. Okay. Um, yeah, my next episode is a story. Uh, it's a, a a murder that happened in uh, in 2013 in Wilmington, Delaware. It's a murder of a. Uh, of a young couple, um, and uh, they, I mean, uh, I don't mean young couple, I mean a brand new couple. They were, they'd only been married 107 days, wow. and they met online, um, and the, 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 the murders were wrapped around this colossal family feud in which, you know, one family member took a diamond ring from some other, from another family member had it made into an engagement ring for, for, for this, this, the, the, the woman who got married and then swapped out cubic zirconia into the old ring and gave it back to that previous, the family member. I mean, it was, it, 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 there was so much anger generated by that, that, uh, uh, the, the, that alone will just uh, will, will stun you about how that story goes. Um, and this was a case that was very difficult to solve, and it, it involved all kinds of all kinds of phone records and and third parties. And of course, it you know it ultimately came back to sort of deciphering not just the murder, but the you know the 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 lines in that family feud and where they led. Right. It's a it's an amazing story. It really is, and it'll be two hours, and yes. it's uh, scheduled to run on uh, December the eighth. 
Perfect. Two hour datelines are my favorite. If anything ever happens to me, I've requested a two hour dateline. A two hour dateline. I will do a very sensitive job. I I want, I mean, I want to hear things not like I'm, I want to hear like life of the party. I'm not really, I don't want to go anywhere, but I don't want to hear. Yeah. Like saying like she was in her sweatpants all the time. Just you can leave that out. Just I understand. Well, everyone no. loved me. It, I know. will submit all of the information they need for you. Yeah, there's <laughs> yeah. approved I, I, pictures. I think she's she's going to be a pretty effective uh, interview. <laughs> she might be the cause of my death too. So I, no, don't say that. Which, which, frankly, you know, I mean, you know, that'd be a great twist. Yeah, yeah. you know, it yeah. give you a good episode. So. Yeah, you know, we didn't tell you at the beginning that our podcast is about moms who murder. Yeah, so no. you know, that's right. A little different. Yeah. <laughs> It takes a twist. So uh, <laughs> last thing we were going to ask, uh, we were going to do our little hashtag on my date line. We had a couple submissions. Um, Mandy, do you want to give your first one? Um, that would be from our friend Kim. Your okay. Friend Kim. Yes. This is from Kim, who is uh, at the K Tuck on Twitter. She's the one who won the, the, the proud, proud owner of what was it? Proud. Won? <laughs> Magnet, right? Magnet. And I think, wait, did she, no, she didn't win socks. She won something. She, else. Yeah. They said they were oh, going to send her Dateline socks. Yeah. She's like, so, she's right. the they coolest should. person. She's a nurse. She's a traveling nurse and she like runs marathons. She's, she's awesome. We love her. She is really awesome. And she is hilarious. She participates a lot uh, in our Facebook group and she's That's always great. on Twitter. Yeah, yes. So we love her. Um, so hers was hashtag on my Dateline. Manx has to host. And not only will the only pictures of me be used. In my T Rex outfit, but, but the reason, a T-Rex outfit. <laughs> but the reason I was murdered was because I sustained a mortal injury in my suit because of a fight over the last piece of pizza. Episode title: Total Extinction. <laughs> she did all the work for you, all of it. <laughs> so, uh, so what, what? What? What's? What's my role here now? So you're if <laughs> you're just the host. <laughs> oh, you I see. Can, you okay. Can, you can give us. Um, if you have an on your dateline, we would of course love that. Um, what we're talking about this is about this is about Kim. Oh uh, no, just in general, we the idea of on my dateline. We ended up getting a lot of people making up this hashtag in one of our Facebook groups. On my dateline, you can only you use words, pre-approved what pictures. Date, what will the dateline say about me? Exactly. Right. What would what would your ideal if you had a um, an episode about you? And we hope you never do. No. No, <laughs> no. I hope I never. But I'd be super um, respectful and. Give yeah. Of good okay. Well, um, yeah, that's actually pretty easy. On my oh. dateline, I would hope that domestic violence in this country gets the proper treatment and is exposed as the scourge that it is and the colossal danger that it is. For because sure. I've seen so many stories in which the warning signs were there and people either didn't or couldn't or wouldn't get out of the way. Yeah. Those are always really hard whenever you hear them talk about um, family members that said they they saw things. We we covered somebody recently. All the time, right. And they right. saw something, but they didn't know what to say. And, and, and you know, and so now they, they're living they with felt, it. And they felt uncomfortable. So yep. they didn't say anything. And then somebody was dead. Yeah. But, I mean, I've also seen, I mean, the you know, the story of <clears throat> Paul and Linda Curry in uh, Orange County, California. They both worked at the San Onofre nuclear plant. And... Um, she was mysteriously sick for a long time. Couldn't know it couldn't be diagnosed. And her friends said to her, um, you know, what's happening here. It's Paul. Right. Paul is poisoning you. Paul's trying to kill you. Mm-hmm. And she said, oh no, come on. He wouldn't do that. He's my husband. And then she changed her life insurance mm-hmm. so that he wasn't the beneficiary anymore. The sister was, but she couldn't bring herself to tell him that she'd done that. But I mean, you don't do that on a whim. I mean, you right, gotta right. believe something's wrong. You don't just do that. And she didn't tell him because she couldn't bring herself to, I think. Right. And she didn't leave, even though she had a six figure job and a car and they didn't have any kids. And she had a bunch of friends who would have taken her in, but she'd been married, I think a couple times before. And she didn't want to, didn't want to be divorced again. Yeah. And she just kind of, I think hoped that it would be okay. And it wasn't. Yeah. That's heartbreaking. We, we have two, lighter ones and then we'll we'll sign off okay. um callops and coffee and sips on instagram on my dateline they will catch my killer because they will have found a note from me on my computer that said my husband did not do it please keep looking because he would not know how nor want to handle our kids on our own on his own <laughs> i love that i i identify with that i know i'm gonna what? be live forever 
He, he, he would not know her how to handle what? Their kids. Oh, no right. husband is going <laughs> to, yeah. If you've got wild kids, you are, yeah. you're good to go. Yeah. You, you'll live forever. Um, and the last one from Megan on Twitter, all I really want, well, I want to preface this by you're a big Diet Coke person, right? We've, we've heard you like Diet Coke. Oh, uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. I'm so do my, we. Yeah. We love Diet Coke. <laughs> Wait, a, I have a Diet Coke pin on right Coke now. Zero, not Diet oh, Coke. Coke Zero, not Diet Coke. Oh, Coke Zero. Okay. Yeah. Listen, we might have to fight on that one because I'm, yeah. I'm <laughs> team Diet Coke. So uh, on the on Megan said, all I really want on my dateline is for Manx to be given on camera while being interviewed by Keith, a Coke Zero with orange, and we all watch as his eyes well up with tears as he realizes in that moment that he had won us all over. <laughs> Oh, beautiful that? sentiment. That's who's Megan. That Megan on Twitter. She's lovely. One of our lovely friends. Uh, here's one thing that I'm gonna that I'll give you uh, that, uh, that that hasn't been talked about before. At some point, and I don't know when this is gonna be. We, it needs sort of the right episode. I mean, it needs the right case. Right. Um, uh, Keith and I are probably gonna do a Dateline together. Yes. Um, yeah. Worlds in which, collide. In which one of us. You know, I mean, the ideal thing would be one in which the um, the suspect or the or the or the person of interest um, is not in custody or is yeah. not in custody yet, or maybe is out on bail before trial. Um, and so, one of us does that interview and their family, and the other one does, um, you know, the prosecution and the police and the and the family of the of the the victim, yeah. um, and then we'll sort of tell the story. You know, jointly, one of each of us telling one side, and could, could, could be a lot of uh, could be a lot of fun. It'd be an yeah. interesting way to tell a story for sure. Well, D- Keith gets a lot of press by leaning on things, and you know he's got his Instagram account. So if you need a Manx pocket squares, I'm a, a, a smirk. You've you've got the best smirk in television. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. So I was thank always you. team. Team Dateline, and then, of course, I had a special place in my heart for Morrison until I found you on Twitter. And when I found you on Twitter, you just slay everyone all day. We're we're totally team you. (laughs) Yes. Thank you. We are so happy that uh, you – Hung out with us for a little while, and uh, thank you. I had the greatest time. Thanks so much. Yes, Absolutely. and and continue hanging out with us on Twitter too, because we think you are the best Twitterer. And I just joined Twitter finally yeah. when uh, we started the podcast. I never really knew anything about it, but now I see that Twitter is where it's at. So yeah, yeah, we look forward to Fun. interacting with you much more. Yeah, Absolutely. you can just like our stuff. That's okay. We know <laughs> <Yeah>. you're busy. <laughs> Perfect. Well, have a great week, everyone. And anything else? Anything else from you, Manx? Watch uh, Dateline. Uh, Dateline Fridays at nine, NBC. Oh yes, and this one uh, that we talked about is going to be on December eighth. Uh, yes. It's going to be on. My, I am. I, I mean, look. There's Ten always nine. like some. There's always like the chance that the schedule is going to change a little bit. But at sure. the moment, it's scheduled to be on uh, December the eighth, uh, nine o'clock Eastern, eight o'clock uh, Central. And we've been promised red herrings with this, so yes. we're looking forward there, to some, it. There's a couple of good red herrings here. Yeah. Perfect. Yes. Awesome. Have a great week, everyone. Yes. Bye, guys. Bye. Hey, y'all. Jen and Lindsay here from the Corpus Delicti podcast, here to tell you to check out our show. If true crime's your thing, it's ours, too. Just a little dash of lightheartedness and a hint of Southern charm. Serial killers, controversial cases, historical hallmarks, we've got it all. So just join us every Tuesday on iTunes, Podbean, or many other podcast apps as we dive into compelling cases and crack them open for you. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. That's C-O-R-P-U-S-D-E-L-I-C-T-I. See you Tuesday. Diabolical. Vengeance. Betrayal. Bad hair. Leaning. Hi, everyone. This is Kimberly. And this is Katie. And we have a weekly podcast called A Date with Dateline, a recap of Dateline episodes. We talk about important issues like grainy surveillance footage, cell phone towers, Andrea Canning's white jeans, and Mankey's hankies. We delve into the details of any victim who's ever loved life or lit up a room. So find us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and iTunes to make a date with Dateline. And remember, don't watch alone. A Date with Dateline is a podcast hosted by two professional amateur true crime TV experts with no formal training, but evidence lockers filled with snark and uninformed opinions. Thanks so much for listening to the Moms and Murder podcast. Make sure to check back with us next week for a new episode. 
You can also find us at momsandmurder.com where you can connect with us via social media. Please make sure you subscribe and give us five stars because giving us four stars would be a crime. Thanks so much.